The Splatoon franchise has been mainly marketed to kids ever since its release, being showed as a very colorful and cheerful paintball squid game. Nintendo is known for marketing mainly to children in the past with their games, but different demographics end up actually picking up the games. Older audiences are the ones picking up these games and the ones finding creepy lore implications in every area of the game. As a franchise that wanted to be very warm and welcoming to everybody, turned into something like this. It's confusing how it got this way. With Splatoon 3 releasing a few months ago, this trend has hasn't changed at all. This is Splatoon vs. The Lore. The single player doesn't look very suspicious at first. You spawn in this little canyon thing with Captain Cuttlefish. There's also an upside down Eiffel Tower here. I'll get back to that. In this canyon are several different levels, and this thing called Fuzzy Ooze around all of them. You can get rid of this Fuzzy Ooze by throwing Small Fry at it. Oh yeah, here's Small Fry, but we'll get back to him later. Once you beat these stages, you get onto the boss fight. Well, it's a small boss fight. This guy was the main boss in the Splatoon 1 and 2 story modes, but he's just the prologue boss in this game. And it may not be for a good reason. After you beat this boss, you lose Captain Cuttlefish. After that, you find yourself in this place called Alterna. Alterna is the main single player area, with a rocket ship covered in the fuzzy ooze from earlier. The whole map is covered in this fuzzy ooze, and that begs the question, where did all this fuzzy ooze come from? You meet the Squid Sisters along with Captain, a completely mute character. Also in Alterna are these various kettles around the map that'll take you to various levels. The second you load into one of these levels, you might be very familiar with the layout of how the level starts. These levels and the ones in Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion start the exact same way, with guides for each. Except these guides kill you in different ways if you fail to complete the level under the certain conditions it gives you. These two guides could be tied in some way, it would only make sense. But wait, remember the rocket ship from earlier? Isn't it strange? Just being here? This rocket ship serves massive significance to the Splatoon lore. It all goes back tens of thousands of years ago. Recall for a moment, the first apocalypse that devastated the human race. Those who escaped into the caverns of Alterna were not the sole survivors. There were others who escaped via a giant rocket ship, the Ark Polaris. This ship was laden with many of Earth's species that have been placed in a cold sleep. The mission was simple find another planet to replace the Earth. Considering the circumstances of its launch, the Polaris had a smooth voyage until it reaches the end of the solar system. It was at that point that debris struck the vessel, damaging its navigation system. The crew was able to turn the ship around and head back towards Earth, but the effort was in vain. There was not enough fuel to attempt a landing. The Ark Polaris drifted aimlessly for 10,000 years. Eons passed. The once stable orbit of the Polaris decayed over time until the ship found itself in the inescapable pull of the Earth's gravity. Re-entry was not kind to its inhabitants. All perished, except one, Bear 03, an experimental subject who had retained consciousness within his cold hibernation, survived. For 12,000 years, he had dreamed and plotted. Fully awakened, Bear 03 came to a terrible realization. He had not landed on a new planet at all. He was back on Earth. And yet, it was not an Earth he knew. This Earth, it seemed, was dominated by sea creatures, not a single mammal to be found. In the course of his search for even a single fellow mammal, Barrow 3 used navigational equipment from the wreckage of the Ark Polaris to discover Alterna. It was a wasteland, of course, but a few of the liquid crystals that had once covered the walls and ceiling remained. With knowledge built during thousands of years of dreaming, he repaired some of Alterna's facilities and began researching the crystals. This research bore fruit when Bear 03 compounded some of the liquid crystals with his own fur. The experiment created an entirely new substance with one terrifying property. It could transform any living creature into a mammal. Bear 03 realized the implications immediately. He could restore the planet to a mammalian paradise. He began stockpiling fuzzy ooze, as he called it, within Alterna's still intact rocket. For such a venture, he would require the acquisition of thousands of golden eggs. These were used in the creation of the fuzzy ooze, although the exact details have never been recorded in my memory banks. But Barrow 3 had a plan. He founded a corporation that would go on to employ locals to collect his golden eggs under the name Grizzco Industries. Mr. Grizz, as he was now known, would pay handsomely for them. With fuzzy ooze productions peaking thanks to the assistance of unsuspecting inklings and octolings, Mr. Grizz took the final steps to set his plan in motion. The rocket was loaded. It wouldn't be long for now. 
Let's go back to the golden eggs. He wanted to use these to create the fuzzy ooze, but why would he need to talk to the salmonids for it? This leads on to the next part of the complicated lore. <laughs> The song you're listening to right now is called Happy Little Workers. Don't you think the title is a little odd? Aren't the Grizz co-workers that I talked about earlier actually happy with their job? Do they know what they're getting themselves into? Mr. Grizz naming his theme song Happy Little Workers could be used to drive Inklings and Octolings to work for him, and having them think this is the best option for them because they think the other workers are also happy. How else would Mr. Grizz get people to work for him on a daily basis? Remember, he needs thousands of these golden eggs for his master plan. Now onto the actual gameplay. You are dropped into a site with one of four random weapons on the current weapon rotation, with a group of three other unsuspecting Inklings and Octolings. You fight the Samonids who come up and attack you, sure. You can find boss Samonids that give you the precious and prized golden eggs. You put these eggs in the basket. If you make it to the final wave, good job. Unless there's an emergency, Koizuna emerges, being the final boss. Throwing your golden eggs at the Koizuna does an insane amount of damage in a short amount of time. If you beat Koizuna, congratulations. You earn almost nothing, but a very heartwarming speech at the end. Speaking of speech, the way Mr. Grizz talks, it's not normal. Mr. Grizz talks much more professionally than in Splatoon 2, most likely because his plan to take over the world is in much closer reach than it was in Splatoon 2. Even the employee handbook is a lot neater in Splatoon 3 than in Splatoon 2. But another thing about his speech is that he is very encouraging if you fail, making you want to try again and again and again because you know you're not a failure. Mr. Grizz told you so. This much more polite tone and speech patterns helps a lot with making unsuspecting workers trust you a lot more. And Mr. Grizz knows this. Now let's go back a little bit. Remember when I talked about how Mr. Grizz came back to a whole world full of sea creatures and no mammals? How did this extinction occur? Around when the humans decided to launch the Ark Polaris into space, the Earth would start to flood, causing mass extinction, except for sea creatures. Now, the world is dominated by these sea creatures, but what are some of the results of the flooding? Remember this Eiffel Tower from earlier? This Eiffel Tower is upside down from the mass flooding tens of thousands of years ago. The crater could also be made from this flooding and the erosion that took place on the rocks from the water, but it could also be from the Ark Polaris crashing down onto Earth. With the fuzzy ooze in the crater, it's not out of the question that the Ark Polaris crashed here. Now you may notice a massive hole in the story. How did this flooding happen? There's no way it just happened out of nowhere. Well, the Earth flooded thanks to a series of world wars and an increase of natural disasters, but that doesn't really explain anything. What were these world wars? How was there an increase in natural disasters? But there's something more important than this, more important than how the world flooded in the first place. The massive flooding didn't kill everything. Not all humans died. There were very few humans left on Earth. Log 1 reveals that the few humans left on Earth found a shelter in a vast cavern created by a cataclysmic volcanic eruption. In there, there was a large mass of water to survive. There was an ecosystem being made inside this cavern. This is how the Society of Alterna came to be. The original founders of this society would have absolutely no idea that it would have ties to Mr. Grizz's plan for world domination. This sort of dome shape around Alterna was made from liquid crystals from squid bodily fluids. These liquid crystals would be used to recreate the sky that humans once knew. The human scientists, who were practically rulers, started growing old and elected successors to their positions and power. This immediately backfired. The younger generation wanted out. They wanted to see what was outside of the cavern for themselves. This is where the rest of humanity passed away. The scientists built a rocket with the intention of seeing what is outside the canyon. What is outside of Alterna? This went terribly wrong. The rocket booster energy overloaded the liquid crystals that were around the cavern walls, creating a violent chain reaction. The cavern caved in and killed almost every single human in Alterna. The few who survived would die soon after. This doesn't explain how the earth flooded though. The earth flooding was the sole reason all of this ever happened in the first place. But why? Why did the earth flood in the first place? We could look at examples for 
from real life. Global warming, for instance. Why is Alterna snowy? Most likely because humans weren't allowed to experience snow due to the global warming of Earth, and they decided to make their own since they were basically recreating Earth. The Earth started flooding from global warming, and the snow and ice were melting alongside it. The large amount of natural disasters I talked about earlier could also be from the massive amounts of flooding. Society still progressed on past this point, but leaving humans behind. As Alterna's crystals fell into the water, full of humanity's wishes, they were absorbed by the squids, octopuses, and other sea creatures. Fueled with mankind's wishes, these species began to be spurred by human impulses, and their bodies adapted to match their new desires. Their intelligence quickly grew, they adapted their forms to walk on land, and slowly but surely they strove for the surface. Soon, inklings, octolings, and more had spread out to every corner of the world. Humans are gone. Now sea creatures are roaming around everywhere. What happens now? Where will society go from here? These sea creatures took on human tendencies, so anything could happen. These sea creatures could likely fall into the same traps that humans did. They could doom their own species just like the humans did. Like how the earth flooded, the massive world wars that eventually killed off all humans. These same things could happen to sea creatures. Since they've mutated out of being able to swim in water, actually, they die if they touch it. Did they learn from human mistakes just by absorbing the crystal? If so, would these sea creatures know specific human stories over tens of thousands of years? There's a lot of unanswered questions about what exactly Inklings and Octolings know, but we do know how they evolved. Remember when I talked about how Inklings die in water now? This is because Inklings have been mutated and have adapted to living on land. One of these downsides is not being able to go in water. Now you might think, oh, that isn't that bad, but think about it. Imagine all the problems this could cause with day-to-day -day tasks like drinking water or taking a shower, but actually, how would an inkling go about doing these things? In the Splatoon manga, one of the characters is shown being absolutely drenched in the rain, and they seem completely fine. But manga aside, we don't actually know how inklings would deal with water. I mean, we don't even know if it rains or not. But in the Splatoon 2 hub, there are inklings with cups full of something. Is there inkling safe water? And if these drinks aren't inkling safe, wouldn't that mean that Krusty Sean is killing inklings with his drink tickets? Maybe he got banished from Splatsville because of it. And that's why we have to ink turf for him. Maybe the ink requirement is for everyone to forgive him for poisoning inklings and octolings for around half a decade. Whatever the case may be, I literally have no idea how inklings can deal with rain. And it seems like nobody else does either. I've looked everywhere, nothing. What about some other changes through evolution? If you look at an inkling or octoling very closely, you can see their head bob up and down and stretch like their head is made of jelly. Have inklings decided to not have bones? What else holds up their body? There's a sunk in a scroll that says bones don't exist, but Marie contradicts this statement in one of the missions. From this picture, it looks like Inklings don't have bones, so maybe this is just a translation error. But none of this evolution is important. How long will Earth survive for with these sea creatures ruling everything? Will mammals ever take back Earth? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we're at now.